was following its own version of democracy. But this was a democracy in which free speech and freedom of religion were never tolerated. After surviving an assassination attempt in 1999, President Karimov began a new wave of repression against his opponents, culminating in a 2005 massacre. Human rights organizations say hundreds of peaceful protesters were killed by government troops after an uprising in the town of Andijan. The question now is who will replace him. President Karimov's eldest daughter, Gulnara, was once a favorite to succeed her father, but she fell out of grace over business scandals and an extravagant lifestyle and is currently under house arrest. The country's long-serving Prime Minister Shafkat Mirziyaev and his deputy Rustam Azimov are among the possible successors. Loathed by his critics and described as one of the most brutal dictators of our time, President Karimov's death leaves Uzbekistan facing an uncertain future. Rehan Dimitri, BBC News. Let's talk to our correspondent Sarah Rainsford in Moscow. And Sarah, the emergence of this news has not been a straightforward process. No, not at all. We had a statement earlier today from the government in Uzbekistan saying that uh, President Karimov was in a critical condition following a stroke last week. But uh, the official announcement didn't come until this evening. Uh, before that, though, bizarrely, we heard from the Turkish prime minister sending his condolences several hours before the official announcement. And also from the Georgian president also sending his condolences again before the official announcement. So something peculiar uh, going on clearly as we waited for that official statement. We do now have it. Uh, this is a statement that was read out on state television in Uzbekistan by a very somber looking newsreader in uh, a dark tie and dark suit uh, talking uh, on behalf or reading a statement on behalf of the government and the parliament in Uzbekistan talking of their huge grief, uh, they said, uh, to inform the country of the death of their dear president. Uh, they described Mr. Karimov as a great historic leader. Um, they said his name was synonymous with peace and stability. Now, uh, he is, of course, the man who's led Uzbekistan for 25 years. And now he's gone, there's a big question over who will succeed him and, and the potential for significant uncertainty and potential instability in Uzbekistan because he never appointed a successor and there are big question marks now going forward as to who might take his place. And how important has Uzbekistan been both in the region and more widely? Well, in terms of uh, its international significance, then I suppose it sort of uh, thrust itself to the fore after 9-11, the attacks, the terror attacks in New York, uh, when Uzbekistan uh, then hosted an American military base, which America used for uh, its operations inside Afghanistan against the Taliban. So uh, it was very strategically significant as far as uh, the US-led uh, fight against the Taliban in Afghanistan. Uh, although that base uh, and the Americans were uh, removed from the country uh, later on when there was criticism of a, a government massacre in Uzbekistan uh, in Andijan in 2005. Uh, that's a, a major moment in terms of Uzbekistan's human rights uh, record, uh, something that's extremely widely criticized. Nobody in uh, Uzbekistan has ever been held accountable for that massacre. So uh, Central Asia has played an important role strategically uh, in the region. Of course, as well, uh, it is a country that borders Afghanistan and, of course, critically important in terms of the issue of Islamic extremism. President Karimov has always said that uh, he stands for stability and order and preventing chaos, and he's always presented himself as some kind of bulwark against Islamic extremism, although his critics have said he simply used that as an excuse to silence uh, his own opponents within Uzbekistan. Sarah, thanks very much. Sarah Rainsford in Moscow. Well, Lauren Goodrich is a senior Eurasia analyst with Stratfor. That's a geopolitical and intelligence firm based in Texas. And she says the president's death is very significant. Well, this is an end of an era. I mean, he's been in charge for so long. He's been the symbol of Uzbekistan for over 25 years. However, any successor is going to have to continue on with his policies, understanding the precarious state of Uzbekistan. It's a highly divided country among the clans that consider each other bitter enemies. It also is surrounded uh, along its borderlands with instability, particularly on the Kyrgyz and Tajik borders and along the Afghan borders. So whoever succeeds him is going to have to continue on the policy of keeping the country fairly locked down and in, in, in a very 
heavy-handed manner. So the leader may change, but uh, such a, a tightly controlled regime continues. Very much so. Uh, Uzbekistan is one of the most powerful countries in Central Asia, but it's also one of the most fragile in, in the region. And so the next leader is going to have to understand that it, he has to for, be a very strong leader like Karimov and fill the role in a very um, strong and heavy handed and totalitarian almost way in order to keep stability. He has to reign in clans. He has to think about Islamic extremism coming across the border. He also has to think about the instability of the land disputes along uh, the Kyrgyz and Tajik borders that continually uh, rise up into firefights. And so there's so much instability and uh, fragility among Uzbekistan and that whatever leader takes place um, and continue, will continue on Karimov's uh, rule. And what, what does this mean for Uzbekistan's relations with the wider world? Because, uh, say, 10 years or so ago, a lot of eyebrows were raised uh, at such a, a brutal regime being a significant strategic ally of the West, particularly in the war of terror. Uzbekistan, because it is so fragile, has really turned to a strategy of neutrality. It isn't going to be um, aligned with the West. Um, and it's not going to be aligned with Russia because it doesn't want to be a pawn within that struggle of the West and Russia, as we've seen other countries like, say, Kyrgyzstan next door, in which Kyrgyzstan was aligned with one and the other. And because of that, a lot of instability was bred because of Russian and Western actions inside the country. So Uzbekistan instead has pulled out of pretty much almost all of its alliance network in order to remain neutral and just focus on itself. Eurasia expert uh, Lauren Goodrich. The electronics giant Samsung is recalling millions of its latest top-of-the-range smartphone after reports a small number of them caught fire while charging. Two and a half million Galaxy Note 7s have been sold worldwide after just a fortnight after being launched. The flagship product was due to be rolled out here in the UK today. Our correspondent Rory Kethlin Jones is at a technology show in Berlin. He sends this report. At Europe's biggest technology show, it's Korea's Samsung which makes the biggest noise. And its star product this year is the Galaxy Note 7. This supersized smartphone has won rave reviews in the US and Asia and was due to go on sale in the UK today. Then this happened. Hey YouTube. This American man posted a video on YouTube claiming his Galaxy Note 7 had caught fire and similar reports arrived from around the world. Be careful out there. Everyone rocking the Note 7. It might catch fire, y'all. Samsung held a press conference to announce a radical move. The company was halting sales and recalling the Note 7. A battery issue was behind the fires, though just 35 out of 2.5 million customers had reported problems. 35 is, is a big number, and I think that Samsung is doing the right thing and siding on caution and taking the devices off the market, figuring out why there is an issue with the cells in the, in the battery, which seems to be the problem. This news could hardly come at a worse time for Samsung. Not only does it overshadow the launch of the Note 7 and the many other products on display here, it comes just a week before its deadly rival has its own big phone launch. At an event in California next week, Apple is expected to unveil the latest iPhone. Its sales have disappointed lately, allowing Samsung to pull ahead in the smartphone race. But will such bad publicity affect the way the Samsung brand is seen? We asked some phone owners in Leicester. You don't know if, if it could happen again or any other phone. Or, yeah, it still put me off. I'm not opposed to Samsung products. I think they make good TVs and even good cell phones until I've read that their batteries are exploding. But uh, I think that would put me off to purchasing it for sure. It probably wouldn't put me off. And the reason being is like large companies tend to put things right. In Berlin today, Samsung continued to show off the capabilities of the Note 7, which even works underwater. But customers will now need reassurance that they won't need to take drastic action with a phone which catches fire. Rory Kathleen Jones, BBC News, Berlin. A look at some of the day's other stories. A large explosion in the southern Philippines has killed at least 12 people and injured several dozen more. The blast took place in a busy night market in Davao, the hometown of the Philippine president, Rodrigo Duterte. Pictures from the scene appear to show a street littered with broken glass and overturned chairs. The cause of the explosion hasn't yet been identified. A suicide bomber has attacked a court in northern Pakistan, killing at least 12 people. Police said the attacker threw a hand grenade before running into the court area in the city of Mardan and detonating a bomb. 
A faction of the Pakistani Taliban Jamaat ul ahrar said it carried out the assault. The UN Security Council has called for calm in Gabon, where violence has erupted after Saturday's disputed presidential election. Two more people have died in the clashes overnight, bringing the total number killed to five since President Ali Bongo was declared the winner. Supporters of his main rival, Jean Ping, have accused Mr Bongo of rigging the vote. Millions of workers across India have gone on strike against the government's labour policies. The industrial action disrupted transport services, banks, shops and factories. Trade unions backed by opposition parties say a government decision to raise the minimum wage for unskilled workers doesn't go far enough and there's no social security for millions outside the public sector. For the first time in more than a decade, Florida has called a state of emergency caused by a hurricane. There's been widespread flooding and tens of thousands of homes have been left without power. The storm, called Hermine, hit the coast just before 6 GMT, 2 in the morning local time, east of Tallahassee. As the hurricane moved up the east coast, it was downgraded from a tropical storm to a tropical storm, rather, but there are heavy rains and high-speed winds. Our correspondent, Amy Cole, sends this report. Good morning, America. State of emergency. Hurricane Hermine slams Florida overnight, the first to hit the state in more than a decade. They've not had a battering like this for 11 years. Although Hurricane Harmeen has now been downgraded to a tropical storm by the U.S. National Weather Center, the impact it's had in northern Florida over the past few hours has been catastrophic. As this satellite image shows, you can see the storm barreling towards Florida, rapid and unforgiving. There's widespread flooding after 30 millimeters of rain fell and winds were gusting at 80 miles an hour. Just hours before it hit, Governor Rick Scott warned residents to be prepared. Just remember this, we cannot rescue in the, you in the middle of a storm. You're responsible as we go through this storm. We will do everything we can to help you prepare, but you are responsible. It's life-threatening. We're going to see big storm surge. We're going to see a lot of rain. We're going to see flooding. We're going to see down power lines. We're going to see um, uh, there's going to be a lot of risk if we don't do our job. Everybody needs to be prepared. I got uh, shutters on the front, front, the south and east sides, and I've been down here just checking all my lines and making sure my boat's secure. In what's called the Big Bend region, at least 150,000 homes are without power, schools are closed, and people have been urged to move to higher ground because of flooding. As it moves now from Florida into Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina over the next few days, torrential rain will be the real big story, the risk of flooding. We could see as much as 300 millimetres of rain in one or two spots, if not a little bit more. And the winds will still be a feature because you could see tornadoes in one or two places and those themselves could cause some major damage for some. It may well be hurricane season in Florida and people may well have been expecting it. But the reality is the time and money it will cost to put things right again. Amy Cole, BBC News. The World Health Organization says there's no evidence that anyone who attended the Olympics caught the Zika virus. But a new study into the spread of the virus says that more than two and a half billion people around the world live in areas that may be vulnerable to outbreaks of Zika. The study arrives at that dramatic figure by looking at the numbers of people who travel from Zika-affected areas over the course of the year. The presence of mosquitoes that can pass on the virus and the health resources available in the countries that the travellers are arriving in. Now, the study was published in the Lancet Medical Journey, Journal and it says people in countries like India, Pakistan, Indonesia and Nigeria could be particularly vulnerable to an outbreak. Uh, let's talk to Isaac Boja, Bogosh sorry, uh, from Toronto. He was lead researcher on that study. He's also a tropical infectious diseases consultant. Isaac Bogosh, uh, thank you very much for talking to us. Uh, just tell us how you went about measuring where you think potentially Zika could spread. So we looked at uh, many factors. One of the factors we looked at was travel patterns from Zika virus affected areas in Latin America and the Caribbean to parts of Africa and uh, the Asia Pacific region. We also looked at monthly climate data and temperature data and the presence of the appropriate mosquitoes. And what we could find was we could we found areas at risk for Zika virus that had the appropriate mosquitoes, the appropriate climate and high degrees of travel that all sort of coincided at the same time. And we could make uh, a maps that show areas that are suitable for Zika virus, not just Zika virus introduction, but subsequent Zika virus transmission. 
the figure of two and a half billion people potentially being in areas where uh, there are that are vulnerable to Zika outbreaks is, is terrifying. It's a very dramatic figure. I mean, how worrying do you find that? Do you think that you may have overestimated it? Well, actually, that's our more conservative number. Uh, the, the key thing here is that that's just the number of people that are living in areas that are certainly at risk for Zika virus transmission. All that means is that we know areas that are at higher risk compared to other areas. And what that can do is that can alert countries and uh, people living in those regions to really mount a uh, public health response. So basically what can happen is if a country uh, it knows that they're gonna be vulnerable at a certain time, they might have limited resources, but you can usher in some of those limited resources towards, for example, mosquito surveillance or mosquito control efforts when you know that uh, you're at, at a increased risk of having this virus introduced and, and transmitted locally. You, you mentioned but, uh, we. Sorry, sorry to interrupt you, but you mentioned that many of these countries that you've, you've looked at have limited resources. How confident are you that they would be capable of protecting themselves to this threat? No, absolutely. I mean, and that's, the, that's one of the key messages of, of, uh, of our paper is that a lot of the countries that are at risk are low-income countries and will have limited resources to mount such a response. So what we really need is a global effort. We are all in this together, and we do need a, a coordinated global response to this. So, for example parts of India, parts of Bangladesh, parts of Indonesia, parts of Nigeria, you know, very populous countries that often ha uh, will have limited resources in many regions of those countries could be at risk of Zika virus introduction and transmission. And uh, I think, as you point out, uh, a coordinated global public health response uh, would, would certainly be helpful to, first of all, detect and second of all, manage if the manage cases, if there are, if there are, uh, if the virus is introduced and transmitted. Isaac Bogosh, thank you very much for joining us there from Toronto, one of the lead Thanks researchers in that study. Now, a student at a top American university whose six-month jail sentence for sexually assaulting an unconscious woman last year caused an outcry has been released from prison. 21-year-old Brock Turner, who was a swimming champion, assaulted the woman outside a Stanford University fraternity house. He was freed from the Santa Clara County main jail in San Jose, California, after serving three months. Under the terms of his release, Turner will be registered as a sex offender for the rest of his life. Melania Trump, the wife of the Republican presidential candidate Donald, is suing the Daily Mail online for libel, saying that the newspaper alleged that she was an escort in the 1990s. Her lawyer says the claims are 100% false. The Mail Online has published a statement in which it retracted any suggestion the allegations were true. Here's David Silito. Wife Melania, who's here right now. In fact, come on up, Melania. Melania Trump, the wife of Donald Trump, has, like most other prospective first ladies, faced a good deal of media scrutiny. There was that speech to the Republican convention which bore more than a few similarities to one by Michelle Obama. So many of the same the values, that you like work hard you for, work what, hard you for what you want in life. And in the Daily Mail today, there was a retraction of another story, which had asked questions about her immigration status in the 1990s. Given Mr. Trump's position on the topic, it was a highly damaging accusation. And they also looked at allegations that she'd worked as an escort. Today, in a statement, the Daily Mail said, we did not intend to state or suggest that Mrs. Trump ever worked as an escort or in the sex business. His lawyer is the man who recently represented the wrestler Hulk Hogan and bankrupted the website Gawker. Charles Harder, here on the right, said the accusations were 100% false and tremendously damaging. And it's not just the Daily Mail. Another blogger has been cited in the court papers with a warning to other media outlets. And of course, it's not the first time Donald Trump has taken issue with the press, banning some papers from his rallies and threatening stricter libel laws. His stance on immigration is a central pillar of his campaign. He also needs to enthuse conservative America. Melania Trump's reputation is an important electoral asset. David Saletto, BBC News. The French interior minister says the camp known as the Jungle in Calais, northern France, home to thousands of migrants, will be gradually dismantled. Bernard Cazeneuve said accommodation would be created elsewhere in France to put it, to, as he put it, unblock Calais. Local people have told the BBC that migrants have become more violent and desperate, with large gangs of young men increasingly congregating in the town.
The French police union says reports of robberies, vandalism and assaults have spiked over the summer period. People at the jungle camp are trying to make their way to the UK. Our Europe reporter Gavin Lee has more from Calais. The centrepiece of Calais, Rodin's homage to the French citizens forced to surrender and hand over the keys to the city during the Hundred Years' War. Seven centuries on and many of the town's residents say they feel under siege. A fifth of Calais' population is now made up of migrants. They're more visible in a city they're not welcome in and are desperate to leave. This local family told me the situation is now much worse. I'm scared for my kids. My other girl goes to school. She's 14 and migrants are always in front of the school. That's dangerous. When I go to work at 6 in the morning, I have to lock my car. Here at night, sometimes it's really risky. It's very dangerous when you come across a group of them. You have a 50% chance you will be harassed. It's sad, but I have to say, not all, but a majority of the migrants have recently become very aggressive. Because they've got now, more than ever, nothing to lose. In the nearby park Saint-Pierre, within minutes of filming, a group of young migrant men spot the camera and start throwing stones and abuse, shouting for us to leave. The town of Calais is roughly three miles from the so-called jungle camp, and police spent the last year dismantling and removing people from encampments and squats all around the city to put migrants in one place away from here. But because of the record number, the police union says that's becoming an impossible task. The perimeter of the camp is now half the size it was six months ago, keeping tents away from the road. At the same time, aid workers say the population has doubled to 9,100 in six months and say that's why tensions are now so high. The population is rising and that's why we can think there will be more and more violence because there is no other option proposed to that people. Port officials say one in ten of the migrants who'd stowed away in vehicles heading across the channel managed to evade detection. And as the nights get longer, there will be even more trying to make it through. Gavin Lee, BBC News, Calais. Well, as you'll know, five years of civil war have torn Syria apart. We see many images of destruction and desperation. So this new promotional video from the Syrian Tourism Ministry may come as something of a surprise. Take a look at this official version. Extraordinary. That is the official Ministry of Tourism promotional video for Syria at the moment after five years of civil war. Let's uh, take you back to the main news this hour. After days and hours of speculation, Uzbekistan's state TV has confirmed that President Islam Karimov has died. The authoritarian leader has ruled the country for more than 25 years. President Putin has offered his condolences. One other story to bring you. A smartphone giant Samsung has recalled its flagship Galaxy Note 7 model after reports of exploding batteries. It's also suspended sales of the phone. If you want to get in touch with us, uh, you can do so on Twitter. I'm at Karin BBC. Thanks for watching.